Hello everyone. So in this chapter we're going to discuss the mass storage systems. Um, the main storage system in modern computers is secondary storage which is usually provided by hard disk drives and the non-volatile memory devices. Some systems also have slower larger tertiary storage usually consists of magnetic tapes optical disks or those that can be found in the cloud storage and because the most common and important storage devices in modern computers are the hard disk and the non-volatile memory devices so we'll be discussing these two types of storage in this chapter we'll try to describe their physical structure and then we will consider the scheduling algorithms and then which schedule the order of input outputs to maximize the performance and then we're going to discuss device formatting and management of boot blocks damage blocks and swap space and finally we'll try to examine the structure of the RAID systems so these are the topics that we're going to discuss All right, and for our objectives at the end of this topic you will be able to describe the physical structure of secondary storage devices and the effect of a device's uh, structure on its uses you will be able to explain the performance characteristics of mass storage devices and you will be able to evaluate input output scheduling algorithms lastly you will be able to discuss operating system services provided for mass storage including the RAID for the overview of mass storage system um, conceptually hard disks are rel relatively simple and each disk platter has a flat circular shape so this is the illustration of the moving head disk me mechanism as we all know the platter is shaped like a CD and common platter diameters range from 1.8 to 3.5 inches the two surfaces of the platter are covered with magnetic material and we usually store information by recording it magnetically on the platters and we read information by detecting the magnetic patterns on the platters a disk um, drive motor spins at a very high speed and most drives rotate around 60 to 250 times per second and it specifies in terms of rotations per minute or RPM common drives spin at around 5400 sometimes they are 7200 the others are 10,000 and 15,000 um, rotations per minute but some drives power down when not in use and spin up upon receiving an input output request rotation speed relates to transfer rates and the transfer rate is at the rate at which data flow between the drive and the computer another performance aspect the positioning time or random access time um, is the time to move the disk arm to the desired cylinder or we call it the seek time and the, the time for the side sector to rotate under the head or the disk head is what we call the rotational latency okay although the disk platters are coated with a thin protective layer sometimes the head will damage the magnetic surface and this accident is called head crush so a head crush normally cannot be repaired and it's a result from disk head making contact with the disk uh, surface so the only option is to replace the disk and the data on the disk are lost unless they were backed up to other storage or RAID protected and we will be discussing RAID uh, later on so more about the hard disk drives uh, as you can see from here the platters ranges from 0.85 inches to 14 inches 
but commonly it's now around uh, 3.5 inches and there are some options for 2.5 and 1.8 uh, inches the range is from the 30 gigabyte to 3 terabyte per drive for the performance the transfer rate theoretically it's around uh, 6 gigabyte per second but the effective transfer rate is around 1 gigabyte per second the seek time is from 3 milliseconds to 12 milliseconds to 9 milliseconds which is common for desktop drives and the average seek time measured or calculated based on the one-third of the tracks latency based on spindle speed around 1 over the RPM over 60 which is equal to 60 per rotation per minute thus the average latency is equal to one half of the latency for the performance of the hard disk we, we, we have what we call the access latency the access latency is also considered as the average access time which is equivalent to the average seek time plus the average latency and is measured in milliseconds for fastest disk, disk it's around 3 milliseconds plus 2 milliseconds which is a total of 5 milliseconds and for slow disks um, this is around 9 milliseconds plus 5, 5 4.56 uh, milliseconds for a total of 14.56 milliseconds the average input output time is also equivalent to the average access time plus the amount to transfer divided by the transfer rate plus the controller overhead so for example if you want to transfer a 4 kilobyte block on a 7200 uh, rotation per minute disk with a 5 milliseconds average second time 1 gigabyte per second transfer rate with a 0.1 millisecond controller overhead so the computation will be 5 milliseconds plus 4.17 milliseconds plus 0 0.1 milliseconds plus the transfer time which is 1 gigabyte per second so that will be equivalent to the following result which is 0 0.031 milliseconds and the average input output time for the 4 kilobyte um, block is equivalent to 9.301 milliseconds so that is the computation of the access latency and the average input output time or the average access time the first commercial disk was released on 1956 and um, it's called the IBM Ramda computer and which is included the IBM model 350 disk storage system the the hard disk is only a 5 megabyte or 7 bit characters and the size of the plotter is around 50 by 24 um, 50 that means um, 50 plotters and the size of the plotter is 24 inches in diameter and the access time is only less than or equal to one second so can you, you can imagine from the first commercial disk it's too big and um, I think this is they're going to to transport it using a plane so basically a transporter here is used to lift the the forklift is used to lift the um, the first commercial disk drive, which is the IBM Randa uh, computer. So, for the non-volatile memory devices, which is very growing now in importance, they are described to be electrical rather than mechanical, unlike the hard disk drive. So, basically, the the current memory devices that are considered to be non-volatile memories are the flash memory based um, non-volatile memory which is frequently used in a disk drive like container and in which case it's called a solid state disk right and in other instances it takes the form of a USB drive also known as thumb drive or flash drive 
So we call it like that, or we call it DRAM stick. And it's also surface mounted onto motherboards and act as a main storage in devices like, for example, smartphones. In all forms, it acts and can be treated in the same way. So our discussion of non-volatile devices focuses on this technology. All right. So basically, the this type of devices are more reliable than hard disk drive, but they are more expensive per megabytes. Although the hard disk is more durable because non-volatile memory devices are uh, maybe they have only shorter lifespan, so it it uh, it needs careful management. They also have less capacity nowadays but they are typically much faster the buses can be too slow so we can connect it directly to PCI for example and the difference between the hard disk and the non-volatile memory devices there are no moving parts in the non-volatile memory devices so there is no seek time or rotational latency that's why it's um, much faster than the hard disk drive although the non-volatile memory devices are much faster than the hard disk drives there are also some characteristics that present um, storage and reliability challenges for example they can be read and written in a page increment similar to a sector but they cannot be overwritten rather than the non cell have to be erased first right so the erasure which occurs in a block increment that is several pages in size will take much more time than a read or the fastest operation or a write uh, slower operation than read but much faster than erase so helping the situation is that the the non-volatile memory flash devices are composed of many die with many data paths to each die so operations can happen in parallel using a data path another characteristic is that the non-semiconductors also deteriorate with every erase cycle and after 100,000 program erase cycle the specific number varies depending on a medium the cells no longer retain the data because of the right wear no? and because there are no moving parts the lifespan is not measured in years but in DWPD or the drive writes per day so that measure is how many times the drive capacity can be written per day before the drive fails so for example if you have a one terabyte NAND drive or flash drive with 5 DWPD rating you are expected to have 5 terabyte per day written to it for the warranty period without failure so these limitations have led to several algorithms uh, however fortunately they are usually implemented in the non-volatile device controller and not on the concern of the operating system so the operating system simply reads and writes logical blocks and the device manages how that is done okay because non-semiconductors cannot be overwritten once written there are usually pages containing invalid data and concerning a file system block written once and then later write uh, written again if no erase has occurred in the meantime the page first written has the old data which are now invalid and the second page has the current good version of the block a non block containing valid and invalid pages is shown here in this image and if you want to track which logical block or blocks contain the valid data the controller maintains a uh, file or 
flash translation layer all right this is the FTL table which maps the physical pages that contain currently valid logical blocks it also contains tracks physical block state which blocks contain only invalid pages and therefore can be erased as you can see from the image now if we consider a full SSD with a pending write request for example because the SSD is full all pages have been written to but there might be a block that contains no valid data so in that case the write could wait for the erase to occur and then the write could occur but what happens if there are no free blocks there still could be some space available if individual pages are holding the invalid data so in that case garbage collection could occur and this uh, garbage collection uh, will will implement a system to free invalid page space so that means good data could be copied to other locations which free up the blocks that could be erased and could be uh, could could receive the rights no? however where would the garbage collection store the good data so to solve this problem and improve the right performance the non-volatile memory device uses over provisioning so over provisioning is to provide working space for the um, GC okay so the device sets aside a number of pages so usually it's around 20% of the total as an area always available to write and blocks that are totally invalid uh, invalid by the garbage collection or GC or write operations invalidating older versions of the data are erased and then they are placed in the over provisioning space if the device is full or returned to the free pool the over provisioning space can also help with wear leveling and what is wear leveling this means that each cell has lifespan and the word leveling is needed to write equally to all the cells so that means if some blocks are erased repeatedly while others are not the frequently erased blocks will wear out faster than the others and the entire device will have a shorter lifespan than it would if all the blocks were out concurrently so the controller tries to avoid that by using various algorithms to place the data on less erased blocks so that subsequent erases will happen on those blocks rather than on the more erased blocks so it levels the wear across the entire devices or device it might seem odd to discuss volatile memory in this chapter of mass storage structure but it's also justifiable because the DRAM or the dynamic random access memory is frequently used as a mass storage device specifically RAM drives which are known by many names including RAM disks um, they also act as a secondary storage but they are created by device drivers that curve out a section of the system's DRAM and present it to the rest of the system as it were a storage device so these drives can be used as a row block devices but more commonly file systems are created on them for standard file operations so computers already have buffering and caching so what is the purpose of yet another use of DRAM for temporary data storage after all DRAM is uh, we all know that DRAM is volatile no? and data on a RAM drive does not survive a system crash shutdown or power down so caches and buffers are allocated by the programmer or operating system whereas the RAM drives 
allow the user as well as the programmer to place uh, data in the memory for temporary safekeeping using standard file operations. So in fact, the RAM drive functionality is useful enough that such drives are found in all major operating systems. So in Linux, there is what we call a slash dev slash RAM. In Mac OS, we have the disk util to create them. And in Linux, we have the slash temp of file system type uh, tmpfs. Alright? RAM drives are useful as high-speed temporary storage space. Although non-volatile RAM memories uh, devices are fast, DRAM is much faster. And input-output operations to RAM drives are the fastest way to create, read, write, and delete files and their contents. Many programs use or could benefit from using RAM drives for storing temporary files. For example, programs can be shared or can share the data easily by writing and reading files from the RAM drive. For example, the Linux at boot time, it creates a temporary root file system. Now it calls the, the init uh, RD that allows other parts of the system to have access to a root file system and its contents before the parts of the operating system that understand storage devices are loaded. So the magnetic tape, as you can see from here, I don't know if you have or you are familiar with the magnetic tape, but this was used as an early secondary storage medium. And although it is non-volatile and can hold large quantities of data, the access time is very slow compared with the main memory and drives. And in addition, the random access to magnetic tape is about a thousand times slower than the random access to the hard disk. And it's about a hundred thousand times slower than random access to solid state drives. So tapes are not very useful for secondary storage. But tapes are used mainly for backup, for storage of infrequently used information, and as a medium for transferring information from one system to another. So the secondary storage device is attached to a computer by the system bus or we call it the input-output buses and several kinds of buses are available including advanced technology attachment or the ATA we also have the serial ATA or SATA we also have eSATA and then we have the serial attached SCSI SAS and the universal serial bus or USB and the fiber channel or FC but the most common connection method is SATA because non-volatile memory devices are much faster than hard disk the industry created a special fast interface for non-volatile memory devices and they call it the NVM Express which connects directly to the PCI bus the host controller is the controller at the computer end of the bus and a device controller is built into each storage device and to perform a mass storage input output operation the computer places a command into the host controller typically using memory map input output ports no? which we will try to describe later so the host controller sends the command via a message to the device controller and the controller operates the drive hardware to carry out the command so device controllers usually have a built-in cache data transfer at the drive happens between the cache and the storage media and the data transfer to the host 
at fast electronic speeds of course between the cash holes uh, DRAM via the uh, DMA or direct memory access for the address mapping storage devices are addressed as large one-dimensional arrays of logical blocks where the logical block is the smallest unit of transfer and each logical block maps to a physical sector or semiconductor page the one-dimensional array of logical blocks is mapped onto the sectors or pages of the device sector 0 for example could be the first sector of the first track on the outermost uh, cylinder on a hard disk drive for example and the mapping proceeds in order through the track then through the rest of the tracks on that cylinder and then through the rest of the cylinders from outermost to innermost for non-volatile memory the mapping is from a tuple which is uh, we call it a finite ordered list of chip it could be a block and a page to an array of logical blocks a logical block uh, address or LBA is easier for algorithms to use than a sector, cylinder, head, tuple or chip, block or page tuple. So by using this mapping on a hard disk drive we can at least uh, say in theory that we can convert a logical uh, block number into an old style disk address that consists of a cylinder number a track number within that cylinder and a sector number within that track one of the responsibilities of the operating system is to use the hardware efficiently and for a hard disk drives meeting this responsibility entails minimizing the access time and maximizing data transfer bandwidth so for hard disk drives and other mechanical storage devices that use platters access time has two major components we already mentioned that so we have the seek time which is the time for the device arm to move the heads to the cylinder containing the desired sector and we also have the rotational latency which is the additional time for the platter to rotate the desired sector to the head so the device bandwidth of the disk is considered to be the total number of bytes transferred and the completion or divided by the total number or the total time between the first request for service and the completion of the last transfer and we can improve both the access time and the bandwidth by managing the order in which the storage input output requests are serviced the simplest form of disk scheduling the is the first come first serve um, algorithm or FIFO and this algorithm is intrinsically fair but is generally doesn't provide the fastest service okay so for example we have a disk queue with request for input output to blocks on the cylinders and we have the following sequence 98 183 37 122 14 one two four sixty five sixty seven in that order let's say the head starts at fifty three so that means that this head is initially at cylinder fifty three it will first move from fifty three to ninety eight then it will proceed to one eighty three and then thirty seven back to thirty seven and then it goes forward again to one twenty two back to 14 and then forward again to 124 back to 65 and finally to 67 
for a total head movement of 640 cylinders. So this is a diagram in this figure. So as we can see, the wild swing from 122 to 14. No? So this is, uh, and then back to 124, it illustrates the problem with this schedule. If the request for cylinder 37, for example, and 14 could be serviced together, before or after the request for 122 and 124, so the total head movement could be decreased substantially and the performance could be thereby, uh, thereby improved. So this is a very simple algorithm of this scheduling. However, it's not generally doesn't provide a fast service. So we have another algorithm that we'll try to discuss. So another algorithm aside from the first come first serve scheduling algorithm is the short uh, shortest seek time first algorithm. And this algorithm selects the request with the minimum seek time from the current head position. This scheduling algorithm is a form of um, SJF scheduling. It can, co it can also cause starvation of some request. However, this is better than the first come first serve scheduling because using the same example of sequence of Q and still the head starts at 53 for example so it will from 53 it's going to seek for 65 and 67 and then it will go to 37 14 and then it will proceed to 98 then 122 then 124 and 183 finally we have 236 as the total head movement compared to the FCFS which has 640 cylinders movement of total head movement. So basically SSTF is better than the FCFS scheduling algorithm. In the scan algorithm the disk arm starts at one end of the disk and moves toward the other end. So it serves the request as it reaches each cylinder until it gets to the other end of the disk. And at the other end, the direction of head movement is reversed and servicing continues. The head continuously scans back and forth across the disk. So the scan algorithm is sometimes called the elevator algorithm. Since the, the disk arm behaves just like an elevator in a building, servicing first all the requests going up and then reversing to re service request the other way. So let's return to our example to illustrate our scan algorithm and before applying scan to schedule the request of on the cylinder with 98, 183, 37, 122, 14, 124, 65, and 67. So we need to know the direction of the head movement in addition to the head's current position. So let's assume that the disc arm is moving towards zero and that the initial head position is again in 53. Okay, so the the, the this arm is moving towards zero. Okay? So the head will next service 37. From 53, it will service 37. And then 14. And then at cylinder zero, the arm will be reversed. So it will go to the right. Because the last time it moves to the left, going to zero. But now, as the cil at cylinder zero, the arm will be reversed and will move toward the other end of the disc, which is to the right. Servicing the request 65, 67, 98, 
122, 124, and finally 183. So if a request arrives in the queue just in front of the head, it will be serviced almost immediately. So a request arriving just before uh, behind the head will have to wait until the arms move to the end of the disc, which reverses the direction and comes back. So definitely it's like an elevator algorithm. Alright? The C scan algorithm is a variant of scan which is designed to provide a more uniform wait time. Like scan, the C scan moves the head from one end of the disk to the other and it services the request along the way. But when the head reaches the other end, it immediately returns to the beginning of the disk without servicing any request on the return trip. So if we will return to our example to illustrate before applying C-Scan to schedule the request on this uh, queue, okay, we need to know the direction of the head movement in which the requests are scheduled. Okay, so assume that the requests are scheduled when the disarm is moving from 0 to 199 and that the initial head position is again 53 the request will be served as depicted in this image, no? in this figure. So we can see that after 53, it will serve 65, 67, 98, 122, 124, and 183. And after it reaches at the end, which is 199, okay, it will move to the other end which is zero and then it again moves to the right so it services 14 and lastly 37 so this is the circular C scan okay which is essentially an algorithm that treats the cylinders as a circular list that wraps around from the final cylinder this is the final cylinder to the first one. There are many disk scheduling algorithms that are not included in this coverage because they are rarely used. No? But how do operating systems designers decide which one to implement? To implement right? And how do deployers choose the best to use? For any particular list of requests, we can define an optimal order of retrieval, but the computation needed to find an optimal schedule may not justify the savings over the scan. With any scheduling algorithm, however, performance depends heavily on the number and types of requests. So for example, suppose that the queue usually has just one outstanding request, then all of the algorithms behave the same because they have only one choice of where to move the disk head. They all behave like first come first serve algorithm or scheduling. Uh, scan and C-scan, they, they perform better for systems that place a heavy load on a disk because they are less likely to cause a starvation problem. But there can still be starvation though, which drove Linux to create the deadline scheduler. And this scheduler maintains separate read and write queues and gives reads priority because processes are more likely to block on read than write. So the implementation of Linux um, allows the queues to be sorted in LBA order, essentially implementing C-Scan. And all of the input-output requests are sent in a batch in this LBA order. The deadline keeps four queues, which are two read and two write, one sorted by the LBA and the other by the first come first serve algorithm. Alright, so it checks after each batch to see if there are requests uh, which are older 
than a configured age. Uh, the, the default configured age is around 500 milliseconds. So, if so, the LBA or the logical block addressing queue containing that request is selected for the next batch of input output. The deadline input output uh, scheduler in the default in the Linux Red Hat 7. Um, also includes two others. The first one is the NOOP, which is preferred for CPU bound systems using fast storage such as non volatile memory devices, and the CFQ or the completely fair queue, a uh, queuing scheduler or the CFQ. This is the default for SATA drives, wherein the CFQ maintains three queues with insertion sort to keep them sorted in LBA order which consists of real time, best effort, and idle. Although the algorithms implemented for non-volatile memory or we call it the NVM scheduling they do not contain rotational latency because they, ha they, don't, have, uh, they don't have disk heads but there are still room for optimization. For example, in the Red Hat Linux 7, there is a NOOP scheduler which uses an FCFS policy or first come first serve policy, but it modifies to merge the adjacent request. The observed behavior of the non-volatile memory devices indicates that the time required to service the, red, uh, the reads is uniform because of the properties of the flash memory write service time is not uniform some SSD schedulers have ex exploited this property and merge only adjacent write requests servicing all read, uh, read requests in FCFS order so as we have seen, the input-output occurs sequentially or random. Sequential access is optimal for mechanical devices like hard disk drive and tape because the data to be read or written is near the read and write head. But the random access input access or random access input-output which is measured in IOPS or input output operations per second it causes the hard disk drive or disk head movement and naturally the random access input output is much faster on non volatile memory drives okay and hard disk or an HDD can produce hundreds of IOPS while an SSD can produce hundreds of thousands of IOPS. So basically, non-volatile memory devices offer much less of an advantage for ROS sequential throughput, where the hard disk drive head 6 are minimized and reading and writing of data to the media are emphasized. In those cases, for reads, performance to the two types of devices can range from equivalent to an order of magnitude advantage for NVM devices. Furthermore, while write performance for hard disk drives is consistent throughout the life of the device, the write performance for NVM or the non-volatile devices varies depending on how full the device is. So we can recall the need for garbage collection and over provisioning and how worn it is. So an NVM device near its end of life due to many erase cycles, generally how much worse performance than a few device. Okay? The terms error and detection or error detection and correction are very fundamental to many areas of computing. And this is uh, also true 
to memory, networking, and storage. So the error detection for our mass storages, it determines if there is a problem. Okay? For example, a bit in the DRAM uh, spontaneously changed from 0 to 1. And then the contents of a network packet change during transmission or a block of data change between when it was written and when it was read. So by detecting this issue, the system can halt an operation before the error is propagated. It can also report the error to the user or administrator or warn of a device that might be starting to fail or has already failed. Memory systems have long detected certain errors by using parity bits. So in this scenario, each byte in a memory system has a parity bit associated with, uh, with it. No? That it records whether the number of bits in the byte set to 1 is even parity is equal to 0 or add or parity is equal to 1. So if one of the bits in the byte is damaged, either a 1 becomes a 0 or a 0 becomes a 1, the parity of the byte changes and thus does not match the stored parity. So similarly, if the stored parity bit is damaged, it doesn't match the computed parity. So all single bit errors are detected by the memory system. For a double bit error, it might go undetected. Okay? Um, another error detection method which is common in networking is the cyclic redundancy check wherein it uses a hash function to detect multiple bit errors. So for, for single errors such as uh, zeros and ones and ones to zeros, it's called parity or the checksum. While for multiple bit errors, they use CRC or cyclic redundancy check. Alright? Another uh, error detection mechanism is the ECC or the error correction code that doesn't only detects but can also correct some errors okay so the correction is done by using algorithms and extra amounts of storage but the codes vary based on how much extra storage they need and how many errors they can correct alright for example these drives use per sector ECC and the flash drive uh, per page ECC. So when the controller writes a sector page of data during normal input-output, the ECC is written with a value calculated from all the bytes in the data being written. So in some cases, soft errors are correctable. However, if it is a hard error or a hardware error, it can be detected but they are not uh, corrected. The operating system is responsible for several aspects of storage device management. So here we're going to describe, uh, discuss and describe drive initialization and then the booting from a drive and the bad block recovery. So how do we know that there is a um, bad block recovery? So we will understand it here. So a new storage device is a blank slate. So definitely it's only a platter of a magnetic recording material or a set of an initialized semiconductor storage cells. And before a storage device can store a data, it must be divided into sectors that the controller can read and write. 
Okay? So, um, the NVM or the non-volatile memory must initialize or must be initialized in the FTL created. And this process is what we call the low-level formatting or physical formatting wherein to be able for a new storage to be used initially it should be divided first into sectors that the controller can read and write all right the low level formatting fills the device with a special data structure for each storage location so the data structure for a sector or page typically consists of a header a data area and a trailer the header and trailer contain information used by the controller such as sector page number and an error detection or correction code most of the drives are now level or low level formatted at the factory as part of the manufacturing process and this formatting uh, enables the manufacturer to test the device and to initialize the mapping from the logical block numbers to defect free sectors or pages on the media so it's usually around uh, 512 bytes and 4 kilobytes so if you format a disk with a larger sector size it means the fewer sectors can fit on each track but it also means that fewer headers and trailers are written on each track but it also means okay, that more space is available for user data and some of the operating systems can handle only one specific cent uh, sector size now before we can use a drive to hold the files the operating system still needs to record its own data structures on the device and it does it in three steps no so the following are the steps the first step is to partition the the disk or the device into one or more groups of blocks or pages so what the operating system do is to treat each partition as though it were a separate device for instance one partition can hold a file system containing a copy of the operating system's executable code another the swap space and another a file system containing the user files but some operating systems and file system perform the partitioning automatically when an entire device is to, ma uh, to be managed by the file system so the partition information is written in a fixed format at a fixed location on the storage drive so in Linux the command used to manage partition on storage, storage devices is called fdisk and the device when recognized by the operating system has its own information read and the operating system creates the device entries for the partition in the slash dev no, it's in Linux no from there a configuration file such as the slash uh, etc slash f stub will tell the operating system to mount uh, options such as read only so mounting a file is making the file system available for use by the system and its users so the second step in the storage device management is volume creation and management sometimes this step is implicit as when a file system is placed directly within a partition so that volume is read is then ready to be mounted and to be used 
The third step is logical formatting or creation of a file system. And in this step, the operation system or operating system stores the initial file system data structures onto the device. And these data structures may include maps of free and allocated space and an initial empty directory. Now, for a computer to start running, for instance, when it is powered up, or rebooted it must have an initial program to run no? and this initial program is what we call the bootstrap loader and it's a program that is stored in a boot uh, blocks of the boot partition right for most computers the bootstrap is stored in the in a non-volatile memory flash memory firmware on the system motherboard and it is mapped to a known memory location. Sometimes it can be updated by product manufacturers as needed, but it can also be overwritten by uh, viruses which infects the system. It initializes, the bootstrap loader, it initializes all the aspects of the system from CPU, uh, registers to device controllers, and the, contain, the contents of the main memory. So you can see from here an illustration of the boot partition. We, we have a, a partition called the MBR or the, the partition wherein the boot code is located as well as the partition table. So it's basically uh, uh, a boot sector from the device no, that is used to load the operating system so we call it the bootstrap loader program so the last time we discussed about uh, swapping we presented it in chapter 9 wherein we discuss moving the entire processes between secondary storage and main memory so swapping here in that setting uh, of course when the amount of physical memory reaches a critically low point and processes are moved from memory to swap space to free available memory but in practice very few modern operating systems implement swapping in this fashion rather systems uh, Systems now combine swapping with virtual memory techniques as it was discussed in chapter 10. And then they swap pages. Okay, So the swap space management is another low-level task of the operating system. And virtual memory uses a secondary storage space as an extension of the main memory. And since drive access is much lower than memory access, using swap space uh, significantly decreases system performance. And the main goal for the design and implementation of swap space is to provide the best throughput for the virtual memory system. So in this section, we will discuss how swap space is used and where the swap space is located on our storage devices and how swap space is managed. So basically, swap space is used in various ways by different operating systems, so depending on the memory management algorithms in use. For instance, systems that implement swapping may use swap space to hold an entire process of image including the code and the data segments so paging systems may simply store pages that have been pushed out of the main memory the amount of swap space needed on a system can vary from a few megabytes of this space to gigabytes depending on the amount of physical memory so the amount of virtual memory it is backing and the way in which the virtual memory is used. Note that it may be safer to overestimate than to underestimate the amount of swap space uh, required 
because if a system runs out of a swap space, it may be forced to abort processes or it may crash entirely. So overestimation wastes secondary storage space that could otherwise be used for files, but it does not uh, do other harm. No? Some systems recommend the amount to be set aside for swap space. For example, the Solaris suggests setting swap e space uh, equal to the amount by which the virtual memory exceeds pageable physical memory. In the past, Linux has suggested setting swap space to double the amount of physical memory. But today, the paging algorithms have changed and the most uh, Linux systems use considerably less swap space. Some operating systems, including Linux, allow the use of multiple swap space, including both files and dedicated swap partitions. So these swap spaces are usually placed on separate storage devices so that the load placed on the input-output system by paging and swapping can be spread over the system's input-output bandwidth. For the host attached storage, these are storage which are accessed through local input output ports. And these ports use several technologies, but the most common is the SATA, as mentioned earlier. A typical system has one or few SATA ports, and to allow a system to gain access to more storage, either an individual storage device, a device in a chassis or multiple drives in a chassis can be connected via USB okay, or universal serial bus. Alright? So it can also be uh, a use USB firewire or a Thunderbolt ports and cables. Some high-end workstations and servers, they have uh, more storage or they need more storage or need to share storage so they use more sophisticated input output architecture such as the fiber channel or the FC the fiber channel is a high-speed serial architecture that can operate over optical fiber over a four conductor copper cable so because this because of the large address space and the switch nature of the communication, multiple hosts and storage devices can attach to the fabric, allowing great flexibility in an input-output communication. So as you can see from the figure, a network attached storage or NAS is a storage that provides access to storage across a network. So, a NAS device can be either a special purpose storage system or a general computer system that provides its storage to other hosts across the network. Client, clients access network attached storage via a remote uh, procedure call interface such as NFS for Unix and Linux systems or CIFS for Windows machine. So the remote procedure calls or the RPCs are carried via the TCP or UDP over an IP network. Usually the same local area network that carries all the data traffic to the clients. So that network attached storage unit is usually implemented as a storage array with software that implements the RPC interface. The CIFS and the NFS provide various locking features allowing the sharing of files between hosts accessing a NAS with those protocols. For example, a user log into a multiple NAS or network attached storage with with those protocol it can access her home directory from all those clients simultaneously 
The network attached storage provides a convenient way for all the computers on a local area network to share a pool of storage with the same ease of naming and access enjoyed with a local host attached storage. However, it tends to be less efficient and have lower performance than some direct attached storage options. So, another protocol which is called the iSCSI is the latest network attached storage protocol. In essence, it uses the IP network uh, to carry the SCSI protocol. So, the, the, the networks rather than SCSI cable can be used as the, inter as the interconnects between host and their storage. As a result, hosts now can treat their storage as if it were directly attached even if the storage is distant from the host. One offering from the cloud providers is cloud storage. Uh, it is also similar to the network attached storage wherein uh, it provides access to storage across a network. But unlike the network attached uh, storage, the storage in cloud storage is accessed over the internet or another wide area network to a remote data center that provides uh, storage for a fee or even for free. Another difference between NAS and cloud storage is how the storage is accessed and presented to users. So basically, NAS uh, is accessed as just another file system if the CIFS or NFS protocols are used. Or it can be as a raw block device if the iSCSI protocol is used. And most operating system systems uh, they have these protocols integrated and present. NAS storage in the same way as other storage. In contrast, cloud storage is API based and programs use the APIs to access the storage. An example is the Amazon S3 which is a leading cloud storage offering. Dropbox is an example of a company that provides apps to connect to the cloud storage that it provides. Other examples can be the Microsoft OneDrive and the Apple iCloud. So one reason that APIs are used instead of existing protocols is the latency and failure scenarios of a wide area network. The NAS protocols were designed for use in local area networks which have low, uh, lower latency than wide area networks and are much less likely to lose connectivity between the storage user and the storage device. So if a LAN connection fails, a system using NFS and CIFS might hang until it recovers. With cloud storage failures like that uh, are more likely, so an application simply pauses access until connectivity is restored. One drawback of network attached storage systems is that the storage input output operations consume bandwidth on the data network. So it increases the latency of network communication. And this problem can be particularly acute in large client server uh, installations wherein the communication between servers and clients competes for bandwidth with the communication among servers and storage devices. So a storage area network or SAN is a private network using storage protocols rather than networking protocols. It connects servers and storage units no? as shown in this figure. No? This is a storage area network. So going back the power of storage area network lies in its flexibility. 
multiple hosts and multiple storage arrays can attach to the same storage area network and storage can be dynamically allocated to hosts the storage arrays can be RAID protected or unprotected drives JBOD is the term used or just a bunch of disks so a SAN switch allows or prohibits access between the host and the storage so basically the storage array has controllers it provides features to attach the host it also has ports to connect host to array it has memory which controls the software sometimes an NVRAM and there are a few to thousands of disks sometimes they are RAID or capable of the RAID system they, shared, they have shared storage and of course they are more efficient and the features found in some file systems are present such as snapshots, clones thin provisioning, replication, deduplication, etc. So the figure is the storage area network which is very common in a large storage environment where multiple hosts attach to a multiple storage arrays and it allows flexibility because all of the clients can ask the server and the server is accessing the storage of the arrays for multiple storage of files the storage devices have continued to get smaller and cheaper so it is now economically feasible to attach uh, many devices or drives to a computer system having a large number of drives in a system presents opportunities for improving the rate at which data can be read or written so if the drives are operated in parallel furthermore this setup uh, offers the potential for improving the re reliability of the data storage because redundant information can be stored on multiple drives so a failure of one drive does not lead to a loss of data a variety of this organization techniques collectively called the redundant array of uh, independent disks it's called independent not inexpensive disks okay this is the most commonly used to address the performance and reliability issues so in the past raids are composed of small cheap disks were viewed as a cost-effective alternative to a large expensive disks today raids are used for their higher reliability and higher data transfer rate rather than for economic reasons hence the i in raid no, which was once known as inexpensive now stands for independent all right so let's first consider the reliability of RAID of hard disk drives no? so the chance that some disk out of a set of n number of disks will fail is much greater than the chance that a specific single disk will fail suppose that the mean time between failures or MTBF of a single disk is 100,000 hours then the MTBF of some disk in an array of 100 disk will be 100,000 divided by 100 or equivalent to 1,000 hours or 41.66 days which is not long at all so if we store only one copy of the data then each disk failure will result in loss of a significant amount of data and such a high rate of data loss is unacceptable so the solution to the problem of reliability is to introduce redundancy so we store extra information that is not normally needed but can be used in the event of disk failure to rebuild the lost information so the concept of RAID structure even if a disk fails data are not lost raid can be applied to 
non-volatile memory devices as well. Although non-volatile memory devices have no moving parts and therefore are less likely to fail than hard disk drives. The simplest, um, the simplest but most expensive approach to introducing redundancy is to duplicate every drive. And this technique of duplicating every drive is called mem uh, mirroring. And so with mi mirroring, a logical disk consists of two physical drives and every write is carried out on both drives. So the result is called a mirrored volume. So if one of the drives in the volume fails, the data can be read from the other. So data will be lost only if the second drive fails too before the first failed drive is replaced. The MTBF of a mirrored volume where failure is the loss of data depends on two factors. One is the MTBF of the individual drives. The other is the mean time to repair which is the time it takes on the average to replace a failed drive and to restore the data on it. So basically mirroring provides high reliability but it's expensive. But striping provides high data transfer rates but it doesn't improve reliability. Numerous schemes to provide redundancy at lower cost by using disk uh, striping which combined with parity bits have been proposed and these schemes have different cost performance trade-offs and are classified according to levels called RAID levels. So we describe only the most common levels here as you can see from the image you can uh, in the figure we see P indicates um, error connecting bits correcting bits and C indicates a second copy of the of the data so in all cases so in all cases in the figure four drives in letter A four drives worth of data are stored and the extra drives are used to store redundant information for failure recovery okay, so the C here indicates a second copy of the the data alright so let's assume that these are the original disks and in B they have a RAID 1 mirror disk which provides a second copy of the data okay, in this separate disk so the RAID level 0 uh, it refers to the drive arrays with striping at the level of blocks but without any redundancy such as mirroring or parity bits. In RAID 1 or level 1 it refers to drive mirroring which shows a mirrored organization. As we can see from here the original disks are copied. No? Another set of of this are are seen here as we call it the um, the second copy of the data right the level um, the level one in the level one so this is the mirrored organization but in level four it is also known as the memory style error correcting code or the ECC which are also used in 5 and 6 so we have RAID level 0 which is the original one RAID 1 level wherein it creates a copy of the data in level 4 this is known as the uh, ECC or the memory style error correcting code and level 5 and 6 are considered to be block interleave distributed parity it's also con it also contains ECC 
and then the RAID 6 uh, known as the P and Q redundancy. Okay. So as I have identified the P indicates the P here indicates the the in the error correcting bits and the C corresponds to the copy of the the data. Right? And the Q, like for example in RAID 6, so this is also called the P plus Q redundancy scheme. And it's much like the RAID level 5, but it stores extra redundant information to guard against multiple drive failures. The XOR parity cannot be used on both parity blocks because they would be identical and would not provide more recovery information. So instead of parity, error correcting codes such as the Galois file math are used to calculate the Q. Okay? So in this scheme, two blocks of redundant data are stored for every four block of data compared with one parity block in level 5 and the system can tolerate two drive failures. Alright? For RAID 6, no, which is called the multidimensional RAID level, some of the additional sophisticated storage arrays uh, amplify the RAID level 6. So we can consider an array containing hundreds of drives. So it, it does consider to be a multidimensional RAID uh, uh, level 6. So it logically arranges the drives into rows and columns and implements RAID level 6 both horizontally along the rows and vertically down the columns. So definitely the system can recover from any failure or indeed multiple failures. And it's done by using parity blocks in any of these locations. Right? For simplicity, the figure will only show us the RAID parity on dedicated drives, but in reality, the RAID blocks are scattered throughout the rows and columns. So in this example, we have other types of RAID. We call it RAID level 0 plus 1 and 1 plus 0. So this refers to any combination of RAID level 0 and 1. So RAID 0 provides the performance while RAID 1 provides the reliability. So generally, this level provides better performance than RAID 5. And it's common in environments where both performance and reliability are important. Unfortunately, like RAID 1, it doubles the number of drives needed for storage. So it's also relatively expensive. So in RAID 0 plus 1, now as we can see from here, in 0 plus 1, a set of drives are striped, and the stripe is mirrored to another equivalent stripe. Another RAID variation is the RAID 1 plus 0 here, in letter B, in which drives are mirrored in pairs, right? And then the resulting mirrored pairs are striped. And this scheme has some theoretical advantages over uh, RAID 0 plus 1. For example, if a single drive fails in RAID 0 plus 1, an entire stripe is inaccessible, leaving only the other stripe. With a failure in RAID 1 plus 0, single drive is unavailable, but the drive that mirrors, mirrors it is still available, as, or, uh, as are all the rest of the drives as shown in this. Uh, figure. So regardless of where RAID uh, is implemented, other useful features can be added. And some of the features such as the snapshot and replication can be implemented at each of these levels as well. What is a snapshot? So it's a view of the file system before the last update took place. And replication 
involves the automatic duplication of rights between separate sites for redundancy and disaster recovery and replication can be synchronous or asynchronous so what happens in synchronous replication each block must be written locally and remotely before the write is considered complete whereas in, in asynchronous replication the writes are grouped together and written periodically asynchronous uh, uh, replication can result in data loss if the primary site fails but it's faster and has no distant limitations so one other aspect of most read implementations is a hot spare drive or drives so a hot spare is not used for data but is configured to be used as a replacement in case of drive failure so for instance a hot spare can be used to rebuild a mirrored pair should one of the drives in the in the pair fail so in this way the raid level can be reestablished automatically without waiting for the failed drive to be replaced allocating more than one hot spare allows more than one failure to be repaired without human intervention unfortunately RAID doesn't always assure that data are available for the operating system and its user so a pointer to a file could be wrong for example uh, or pointers within the file structure uh, structure could be wrong incomplete writes called torn writes if not properly recovered could also result in corrupt data so some other process could accidentally write over a file system structures too. RAID protects against physical media errors but not other hardware and software errors. So a failure of the hardware RAID controller or a bug in the software RAID code could result in total data lost. As large as is the landscape of software and hardware bugs, that is how numerous are the potential perils or dangers for data on a system. So the Solaris CFS file system takes an innovative approach to solving these problems through the use of checksums. So CFS maintains internal checksums of all the blocks including data and metadata and these checksums are not kept with the block that is being checksum rather they are stored with the pointer to that block so this is an illustration of that no? so rather they are stored with the pointer to the block okay so we can consider an inode which is a data structure for storing file system metadata with pointers to its data so within the inode is the checksum of the uh, of each block of data so if there is a problem with the data the checksum will be incorrect and the file system will know about it if the data are mirrored and there is a block with the correct checksum and one with an incorrect checksum the CFS will automatically update the bad clock or bad block with the good one so similarly the directory entry that points to the inode has a check sum for the inode and any problem in the inode is detected when the directory is accessed so the check summing takes place throughout uh, throughout the CFS structures providing a much higher level of consistency error detection and error correction right so the CFS combines file system management and volume management into a unit providing greater functionality 
than the traditional separation of those functions uh, allows, wherein the drives or partition of drives are gathered together via RAID sets into pools of storage. So a pool can hold one or more CFS file systems and the entire pool's free space is available to all file system within the pool. So CFS uses the memory model of uh, MA or M allocation function and the free function memory allocate which memory allocate or release calls. So basically general purpose computers they typically use file system to store content for users but another approach to data storage is to start with a storage pool and place objects in that pool. So this approach differs from the file systems in that there is no way to navigate the pool and find those objects. So rather than being user oriented, object storage is computer oriented, designed to be used by programs and a typical sequence is uh, create an object within the storage pool and receive an object ID. Okay, so an object just as a container of data and then access the object when needed via the object ID alright and lastly delete the object via the object ID object storage management software such as the Hadoop file systems and the Ceph uh, determines where to store the objects and manages object protection so typically this happen on commodity hardware rather than read arrays for example the HDFS or the Hadoop file system can store n number of copies of an object of on n number of systems or computers okay so all uh, this approach can be lower in cost than storage arrays and can provide fast access to that object at least on those n number of systems but all those systems in a Hadoop cluster can access the object and only systems that have a copy have fast access via the copy so computations on the data occur on the system so therefore object of, uh, storage is usually used for uh, bulk storage not high-speed random access and the object storage has the advantage of horizontal scalability so what is that so that is where the storage array has a maximum fixed capacity so if you want to add capacity to an object store we simply add more computers with internal disks or attach external disks and add them to the pool Right? Another key feature of object storage is that each object is self-describing, including description of its contents. In fact, object storage is also known as content addressable storage because objects can be retrieved based on their contents and there is no set format for the contents so what the system stores is unstructured data. So while object storage is not common on general purpose systems or computers, huge amounts of data are stored in object stores. So that includes Google's internet search contents, Dropbox contents, Spotify songs, Facebook photos, uh, cloud computing such as Amazon, Amazon AWS. They generally use uh, object stores for example in Amazon S3 to hold file systems as well as data objects for customer applications running on cloud computers so that's it so in this topic we discuss uh, concepts of hard disk drives and non-volatile memories or devices and they are what we call the major secondary storage 
uh, input output units in our system and the modern story uh, secondary storage is structured as large one-dimensional arrays of logical blocks now the drives of either type may be attached to a computer system it can be through a local input output uh, port on the host computer or it can be directly connected to the motherboard it can also be connected through a communications network or storage network connection so what are the things that we discuss uh, we discuss about the different disk scheduling algorithms we discuss about the uh, scan and the C scan also the first come first serve algorithm the shortest seek uh, algorithm and then we discuss about data storage and transmission which are complex and frequently result in errors so to resolve that uh, a mechanism was created for the mass storage systems which are we call it the error correction and detection uh, error detection and correction the other things that we discussed all right lastly we discuss about the um, swap space no which is a good to uh, which has which is a good uh, a key to good performance in many systems um, it dedicates a row partition to swap space all right and other uh, others use a file within the file system instead so lastly we discuss about the raid system because the amount of the storage required is requiring uh, um, multiple copies of the data and because storage devices fail in many ways secondary storage devices are frequently made redundant no it's by using read algorithms and these algorithms allow more than one drive to be used for a given operation and allow continued operation and even automatic recovery in the face of drive failure so RAID algorithms are organized in many ways, no? Uh, as we have discussed. Lastly, we discuss about cloud storage, how they are accessed using the internet. And that's it. Thank you for your